format. We will have witnesses testifying both in person and by video, and senators may appear in person or by video as well. I want to thank Senator Rounds for joining me in this bipartisan hearing focusing on the issue of homelessness. Um, Senator Rounds found out late yesterday, I think, that he is needed at an important markup of the Foreign Relations Committee, so he won't be able to stay for the entire um, subcommittee, which we understand, and thank you for being here. Um, and thank you also to our panelists, those of you in person as well of, as those of you joining virtually for being here today. So without a safe, decent, affordable place to live, nothing in your life works. It's nearly impossible to maintain a job, go to school, or stay healthy. Based on data from 2020, almost 600,000 Americans experience homelessness on any given night. Of this number, 61% of those experiencing homelessness are sheltered, and another 39% are unsheltered. Homelessness is a significant challenge in our country and getting worse. While current national data is sparse, we know that the number of people experiencing homelessness, already too high, began rising again around 2015. And of course, the pandemic has only exacerbated the challenges that individuals and families face. But addressing homelessness is an area of bipartisan interest in the Senate. For example, Senator B Bennett and Senator Portman, along with our full committee chair, Senator Brown, have introduced the Eviction Crisis Act, which would direct assistance to families who are most at risk of losing their homes and help prevent families from becoming homeless. Their bill draws on the lessons of the pandemic, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about that important bipartisan measure. I also know that several other colleagues on this subcommittee have been working on important bills to address homelessness, and many of them bipartisan. Senator Van Hollen leads legislation with Senator Young to provide opportunities for family mobility. Senator Reed and Senator Collins have worked together for years to strengthen the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. And while it's outside this subcommittee's jurisdiction, Senator Cantwell and Senator Young have had a bill to reform and expand the low-income housing tax credit. These examples illustrate the bipartisan, important work happening in the Senate, and I look forward to hearing from the witnesses today about these pieces of legislation and how we can work with everyone to try to advance some of these measures. It also must be acknowledged that the biggest factor in the rise in homelessness is the severe shortage of affordable housing and the lack of housing supply. People sometimes have the misunderstanding that folks end up on house because they experience mental illness or substance use disorder, when the reality is that most people become ill because they don't have a safe, affordable place to live. In my view, the answer is to provide shelter and housing first and the supportive services that are necessary to help people get stable and healthy. The backdrop to the issue of homelessness is that our nation is facing an affordable housing crisis. According to data published by the National Low Income Housing Coalition, not one state in our country has an adequate supply of affordable rental housing for the lowest income renters. In fact, for the 1.8 million families with extremely low incomes in the United States, there is a shortage of more than 7 million affordable homes. This is an incredibly alarming problem that we all face in every part of the country. The challenge finding and keeping a safe, affordable place to live is real in every part, urban, suburban, and rural. It affects everyone. However, homelessness also disproportionately affects some communities more than other, including black, Latino, and native communities. In my home state of Minnesota, while Native Americans make up uh, about 1% of the adult population, the 2018 statewide homelessness study found that Native Americans make up 12% of the adults experiencing homelessness. The experience of Native people and tribes around homelessness led me to partner with Senator Murkowski, ranking member of the Indian Affairs Committee, to write and pass our bipartisan Tribal Access to Homeless Assistance Act, which makes tribes eligible for Department of Housing and Urban Development homeless assistance funds through the Continuum of Care program. We're now focused on implementing this law and hope to hear today what we can do to make sure it's successful. Additionally, homelessness remains a significant challenge for veterans. No one who serves our country should ever find themselves without a safe, decent place to call home. In recent years, bipartisan efforts have sharply reduced the rate of homelessness among veterans, but there's more that we must do. I know that this is a priority for Senator Rounds, and I look forward to working with you on this issue, as well as with the tribal and native housing issues that you and I have collaborated on frequently. Homelessness is not only a housing crisis, but also a public health crisis. 
as a lack of housing exacerbates health challenges. Simply put, housing is a social determinant of health. The COVID-19 public health emergency created new challenges for unhoused people, both for people living in congregate shelters where there were deep worries about safety and public health, as well as people without any shelter at all. The CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan provided billions of dollars in emergency solutions grants, rental assistance, and homeowner assistance to help people avoid foreclosure and to keep them in their homes. This emergency funded, directed to states and local providers, made a huge difference, keeping people healthy, safe, and sheltered. And it created opportunities for community organizations to improvise and innovate. However, much of that funding is now coming to an end. So I hope that today we can hear both what we've learned from the last two years in terms of innovative strategies that have worked and also what our experience has been, what our experience tells, about, tells us about the importance of adequate funding for homelessness prevention efforts. You know, I often hear from people who work in this field that we know what to do to solve this problem. We just need the will to fix it. We have data-driven strategies that have proven effective in addressing homelessness in recent years. We've seen this in veterans, um, addressing veterans' homelessness in my home state of Minnesota. The Housing First model builds on what we know, that if you don't have, again, a safe, stable place to call home, it's very hard to hold on to a job, go to school, or get the health care that you need. It has been successful in reducing homelessness in many parts of the country, and I believe that we should build on its success. Addressing homelessness has long been an issue that Republicans and Democrats have shared concerns about. I hope that in this hearing we can continue this bipartisan work and look for concrete steps to take together to address this challenge with a comprehensive approach, effective strategies, and the resources that we need. Thank you, and I now turn to Senator Rounds for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Smith. And once again, I will apologize for having to leave early. We have uh, the markup of the uh, session into NATO for uh, Sweden and Finland this afternoon, and um, this is one that we, we want to move forward on rather quickly. Uh, first, I would like to thank our witnesses for taking the time to be here today, especially Jamie, who is coming to us from Rapid City, South Dakota this afternoon. From Sioux Falls to Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles, Americans are experiencing growing housing insecurity. Homelessness implicates several critical issues. America's acute shortage of affordable homes, behavioral and physical health challenges, addiction and domestic abuse, and violence. Therefore, the need goes beyond just a safe place to stay. Individuals also need supportive services, whether it is clinical help, career coaching, or case management, so they can break the cycle of homelessness. That is why organizations like Journey On, which is successfully working in Rapid City, as well as the Doe Fund in New York, have an expanding array of supportive services, including job training, child care, and others that are successful in going well beyond shelter. Journey On successfully partners with law enforcement in Rapid City, South Dakota, to provide social services and casework management for calls related to unsheltered individuals. However, Journey On, like many nonprofits across the nation, have run into mounds of government red tape. Even when they have received federal dollars, the money takes too long to be released and the paperwork burden is onerous. We should be removing barriers to addressing homelessness, not creating new ones. Over the last decade, HUD has pursued a housing first approach to helping homeless individuals and families obtain stable housing as quickly as possible without barriers or preconditions. However, the Housing First model often ignores the underlying causes of homelessness and are only proven to be effective at curbing homelessness at the individual level rather than at the broader community level. HUD now allocates roughly 75% of all competitive grants to permanent supportive housing projects, even though these projects were originally intended to serve just a portion of the total homeless population who are chronically homeless. This sole reliance on Housing First has prevented federal assistance for any alternative approaches by housing providers that may better address local housing needs. The Doe Fund, based in New York City, but operating nationwide, is a stunning example of how federal policy disadvantages organizations that have made incredible strides in combining stable housing, dignified work, and life coaching 
to improve their, cl their clients' lives. An analysis of the Doe Fund's work found that in 2020, 82%, that's 82% of graduates maintained their jobs months after leaving the program with an average starting wage of $16.60. For every dollar New York City taxpayers spent on the program, they saved an average of $3.60 in costs from emergency city services and criminal justice costs. These successes raise serious questions of how we prioritize federal funding. Although a housing first model may be effective in some cases, a one size fits all solution is not the answer. We should instead give communities flexibility to implement interventions that address their issues. We also need greater local level accountability with the continuum of care funding distribution model used by HUD to make certain more homeless dollars are used to help those with the greatest needs. Untargeted government spending is particularly inappropriate at a time of elevated inflation. HUD should put into place performance measures that indicate whether the program is succeeding or failing in reducing the number of people experiencing homelessness. Veterans represent a unique subgroup of the entire homeless population as they are eligible for specialized federal programs and benefits. Despite tremendous success in reducing the number of homeless veterans over the past decade, tangible impediments remain in securing adequate housing for this group, including a severe shortage of affordable homes, underutilization of the HUD-VASH vouchers, and a lack of VA support and medical staff. Every single veteran should have a place to call home which is why I have sponsored legislation like the Reducing Veteran Homelessness Act, which would make much needed improvements to both the HUD-VASH and the grant and per diem programs to make sure every veteran has the resources they need to find a home. Nationwide, Native Americans have the second highest rate of homelessness according to the National Alliance to End Homelessness's 2020 State of the Homelessness Report. Furthermore, for those Native Americans who live on the reservation, traditional homelessness tends to not be as big of a problem as underhousing and overcrowding. According to a 2017 Urban Institute report, 16% of tribal area households were overcrowded and 6% were severely overcrowded. Overall, there is a major lack of reliable data and research on Native homelessness and overcrowding, and it's something I believe HUD should prioritize. I want to once again thank um, Madam Chair for holding this important hearing, and I look forward to this discussion on how to address homelessness in America, especially among our Native and veteran populations. This is one area where Republicans and Democrats really do work together in a bipartisan fashion, and it's one area that I really think we can find additional success. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Rounds. I am now going to introduce our witnesses. I will introduce all five of you and then turn to each to make your opening statements. We have three witnesses who are with us in person today. Um, Anne Oliva, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Allow Alliance to End Homelessness. Isabel McDivitt, who is the co-founder and board president of WorkWorks America. Catherine Monet, Chief Executive Officer of the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans. And joining us remotely, we have Kathy Tenbrook, Assistant Commissioner and Executive Director of the Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness, and Jamie Kirsch, board member from Journey On, based in Rapid City, South Dakota. Welcome, and thank you all for your willingness to speak with us today, and I look forward to hearing from each of you. And before you begin your opening statements, I just have a few reminders. Uh, for witnesses and senators joining us by video, once you start speaking, there will be a slight delay before you are displayed on the screen. To minimize background noise, please click the mute button until it is your turn to speak or ask questions. You should all have one box on your screens labeled clock that will show you how much time is remaining. And for all witnesses, you will have five minutes for your opening statements. Your full written statement will be made part of the record. For all senators, the five-minute clock applies to your questions. If there is any technology issue, we'll just move on to the next witness until we get it figured out. Um, and um, for the information of senators, um, we will have um, 
opportunities for everybody to ask all of your questions during the course of this hearing. So I'm happy to stay here as long as people's questions um, um, are still ready to be answered. And I will now turn to Ms. Oliva for five minutes of opening statement. Great. Thank you so much. Chairwoman Smith, Ranking Member Rounds, and members of the subcommittee, Again, my name is Anna Oliva. I am the CEO of the National Alliance to End Homelessness and a board member of True Colors United. Thank you again for having me testify today. I want to commend the subcommittee for the housing-related relief measures enacted during the pandemic. I'm going to talk about the positive results of those investments momentarily, but first, I want to start with the data. All the reliable evidence tells us that the situation for people experiencing homelessness is incredibly urgent and that the homelessness crisis, which predates the pandemic, will persist without serious intervention. In 2020, HUD reported two unfortunate firsts. We saw an increase in the number of people and families living unsheltered, and we saw the number of individuals living on the streets exceed the number of individuals living in shelters for the first time. More than 580,000 people experienced homelessness on a single night in January of 2020, and one and a half million people experienced sheltered homelessness at some time in 2018. People of color and historically marginalized people are disproportionately impacted by homelessness. Families experiencing homelessness are typically headed by women, many are headed by young parents, and they include a high percentage of young children. Youth, veterans, and adults experiencing chronic homelessness are suffering on our streets and in our shelters every day. And data shows that more than half of sheltered people and 40% of unsheltered people work but still can't afford housing. Most continuums of care that we surveyed believed that unsheltered homelessness has increased. But our information from the field also indicates that the number of families experiencing homelessness seems to have decreased during the pandemic. And this is likely the result of pandemic relief measures like the child tax credits, unemployment insurance supplements, emergency rental assistance, the eviction moratorium, and other steps that the federal government took to protect extremely low-income families from the impacts of the pandemic. Those programs worked. But as those policies and investments end, at the same time, that we see rents skyrocket nationwide, we can expect to see negative consequences if we fail to act. Skyrocketing rents make it harder for low-income people to stay in their homes, create even greater challenges for people exiting incarcerations or systems like the child welfare system, and make it even more difficult to get people experiencing homelessness into safe and affordable housing. The inability of people to afford housing is the major driver of homelessness. People experiencing homelessness do absolutely want and need other resources like health and behavioral health services and employment services, no doubt. But a safe, stable, and affordable place to live ends homelessness and provides the foundation for achieving other life goals. The housing investments made as part of the nation's pandemic response helped people across the country to keep or get into housing. For example, about 3.8 million households received emergency rental assistance so they could stay in their homes. Nearly 90% of the 70,000 emergency housing vouchers for households experiencing or at risk of homelessness have been issued or leased. We can learn from what has worked and what hasn't as we look to the future, but given the circumstances, we know that these programs are not enough because we are facing daunting challenges. Rising rents and low vacancy rates make finding and keeping permanent housing more difficult for homeless and at-risk people. Homeless systems consistently report significant staffing challenges like shortages, high turnover, and burnout. Linking mainstream health and behavioral health services with housing can be a challenge, and criminalization of people experiencing homelessness is rising. But as you mentioned, we know what works. Making evidence-based policy decisions in addition to sustained investments in housing and services at the national level is critical. This includes protecting the affordable housing stock we have, increasing supply, increasing affordability by expanding the Housing Choice Voucher Program, and making the services that people want and need more accessible. And further, it means supporting evidence-based approaches that prioritize permanent housing and choice 
as the foundation for healing from the trauma of homelessness. It also means partnering with people who have lived experience so the changes we make are informed by real world and practical expertise. The information we have tells us that the public wants an end to homelessness, not by criminalizing people, but by implementing sound housing and service solutions so that people can thrive. We know how to do that. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to Ms. McDivitt. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to the committee for hosting us today. My name is Isabel McDevitt, and I am co-founder and board chair of WorkWorks America. And I have worked in direct services since 1998 in cities such as New York, Philadelphia, um, and Metro Denver, Colorado. I'm here today to talk to you about the WorkWorks model as an example of how we need to expand our toolkit to address homelessness in cities across this country. Um, thank you for my fellow witness and um, for both uh, Senator Smith and Senator Rounds for your introductions. I do not need to tag on more around the need. Um, but what I do want to talk about is solutions and what we need to do to expand our response. The WorkWorks model was founded 30 years ago in New York City by the Doe Fund, and it has since been scaled to, to six communities nationwide. We regularly get requests from many, many more. We are in Atlanta, Georgia, Colorado, Philadelphia, and working on Denton, Texas, and Portland, Maine. But what we know is that the combination of paid work and social enterprise coupled with transitional, safe, supported housing and support services is fundamental for people experiencing homelessness that are not qualifying for other resources. In a HUD report um, earlier this year through the House America program, it was indicated that for adults experiencing homelessness, we only have 15 units for 100 people on the street. This is both an eligibility issue and an availability issue. So yes, we need to expand access. But what I have seen by running services on the ground, particularly in my work in Colorado where I founded the Ready to Work program, we see that as a shelter provider, essentially breaks down a third, a third, a third. A third of people come in, self-resolve, you don't see them for more than a couple days, and they're on their way. A third are eligible for a lot of the HUD-funded programs that you've heard about today, permanent supportive housing, VASH, and so forth. But what about that middle third? And this is where I ask you today to think about expanding our response. And most importantly, two key factors, looking at policy and expanding the ability to act quickly and swiftly with creative models. So this means flexibility about what we define as housing. There are people on the streets that would prefer to live in a co-op, would prefer to live in a tiny home. And frankly, that can be much more practical to implement on the ground. Secondly, let's share our response with other uh, players. So the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness already has a format for doing that. Let's engage other agencies beyond HUD, Department of Labor, Department of Justice, and others to look at these populations that are disproportionately represented in uh, our homeless populations across this country. The WorkWorks model is one example, and what I will say is it's a great example of how, with creativity, we can leverage uh, public-private partnerships, and bring models to cities across the country. The WorkWorks model, like I said, can be, combines paid work and social enterprise. So what that means is people are going to work, they're earning money, they're saving money, and they are preparing to re-enter the mainstream workforce. We all know we have a labor shortage. So why aren't we creating ways to reach into marginalized communities with not only access, but good, better-paying jobs to meet our labor needs? This is an untapped population. The second leg of the WorkWorks model is housing. In Colorado, we renovated office buildings into high quality dormitory housing with privacy as well as community space. We did it in 16 months in two different locations in Colorado, renovating existing real, commercial real estate. That is something that we should be looking at as another tool in the toolkit. It's wonderful to build from ground up but what about the cost? What about the timeline? And what about all the issues of NIMBY? This is a model 
that is just one example of how we need to get creative. And then lastly, connections to supportive services. We see incredible um, challenges on the ground related to opioid use, related to all types of behavioral health concerns, and the public crisis of just the trauma of being on the streets. We can cut you know, homelessness, the, the length of homelessness in half or even less, or we can be swift and respond so much more quickly if we have more tools in our toolkit. So I ask this committee to really think through those two key points. How can we look at our policies and expand our ability to act? And second, how can we bring more players to the table? Our communities need it, and we need to promote innovation on the ground because our communities know what they need, and they need more uh, tools to be able to help them get there. So thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Monet. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Um, as you all know, 82 communities in three states have actually achieved the federal benchmarks and criteria for ending veteran homelessness. But there were still 37,252 veterans homeless on any given night in 2020. And when we think about how we got to that point, we know that decreases in veteran homelessness were due in large part to congressional investment in key federal programs, implementation of evidence-based solutions like Housing First, and dedicated coordination at the national and local level. Uh, homelessness is caused by a fundamental mismatch between the availability of affordable housing in a community's market and an individual's ability to pay for that housing. And this mismatch, paired with the results of systemic and institutional racism, has been the major driver for the nationwide rise in housing instability, particularly among marginalized and minoritized people and veterans alike. During the pandemic, what we saw in the veteran space was that homeless service providers pivoted their programming, they reimagined what was possible for veterans, they reconfigured a whole lot of congregate transitional housing, and they worked so hard to keep veterans in their community safe and moved on to permanent housing. Uh, the confluence of rising inflation rates in our current economy and the housing affordability crisis that we're seeing paired with the winding down of pandemic assistance programs like ERA in many communities creates this perfect storm where we're going to see homelessness increase if we do nothing. In my opinion, now is the time that we need to create permanency among programs, particularly those for VA that have continued on these 90 day extensions because they were authorized and that authorization is actually tied to the end of the public, state, or local health emergency. Uh, we need to continue to implement lessons that we've learned during the pandemic, and we also need to double back to address persistent barriers that slow the housing placement process and perpetuate further inequities. It's no secret that normal pre-pandemic was not really a great normal for a lot of people who were facing housing instability, and homelessness is really like a symptom of those challenges, right? And so when we think about the growth of the unsheltered population, we do need to focus on crisis response services like shelter and outreach, but really we need to address the root causes. So we need to think about how we can develop more affordable housing, address you know affordability, rather than thinking about ways that we can utilize law enforcement as sort of the default response to a social problem. Housing affordability, I think, is the number one challenge that we hear from our members who are working with veterans who are exiting homelessness. And nationwide, there are approximately 36 affordable units for every 100 individuals searching. And that's a recipe for disaster. The housing shortage has actually driven nationwide rent increases. And we've seen that rents have increased by over 17% just in 2021 alone. And I think by another 5% this year until July 1. So I think what we see is that this shortage of units is really gonna increase the risks and just create a whole lot of pressure for folks out there who are looking for housing. So we know, and I'm telling you this again, I hope you're hearing me, invest in affordable housing, please. Congressional support for VA's homeless programs was really great during the pandemic. It created flexibility, it offered new spending authorities to meet emergent needs, and it ramped up the capacity of VA programs during COVID. But sufficient funding must be incorporated permanently into non-emergency appropriations and authorization caps to maintain our ability to respond effectively as we move away from COVID-specific emergency funding. Uh, the GPD program, which is VA's transitional housing program, awarded two rounds of capital grants for providers to decongregate facilities during COVID, and we think that those grants should be continued and enhanced. 
We also feel that the daily per diem rate must be addressed. At the sunset of the public health emergency, the maximum reimbursement rate will drop from $152 a day to $60 a day. And that's a rate that's designed to provide overnight housing, meals, and wraparound services and supports for homeless veterans. So we recommend that you pass S2172 to directly address these issues immediately. Uh, the SSVF program shallow subsidy initiative has recently been expanded due to its success during the pandemic and we support its expansion and recommend further study so we can continue to improve this program. And I do wanna just touch quickly on the HUD BASH program because it's been fairly successful at meeting the acute needs of veterans. However, I do think that VA has really struggled with offering case management services to veterans. Um, despite the program's successes, we do think that there is more VA can do to diversify the options there and also to think about contracting and doing other things to staff up. The second challenge that they're facing with this program is that vouchers are just more challenging to use because of the housing affordability crisis and the stigma that some landlords have against accepting vouchers as a form of rental payment. Uh, the last thing I do want to say is that staffing for both VA and its grantees remains a challenge. There are only so many qualified providers in any region, and to, to a certain degree, they're competing for the same amount of talent or the same talent that exists in the pool. So we do think that Congress needs to look at how they can support VA and providers to address this challenge. Thank you for your continued interest in addressing veteran homelessness. Thank you so much, Ms. Monet. Uh, we'll now turn to, let me just, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're, I'm really um, delighted that we're joined by the, um, by the big chair of the Banking Housing uh, Committee, and thank you for being with us, uh, Senator Brown. Would you like to sure. say a few words? That, thank you, Senator Smith and Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the witnesses, Ms. Monet, Monet. Thank you for your work on the Veterans Committee and your work with, on your comments about hud -Vash, how important that is. I, I apologize for not being able to stay, but I just wanted to, I wanted to stop by and thank Chair Smith and Ranking Member Rounds for the terrific work they do. They work together as well bipartisanly as any chair or vice chair I've seen in this institution, and I appreciate them for that. And Jack Reed has been working on combating homelessness um, almost as long as Tina and I have been alive. So certainly <laughs> before, we were, before we were oh. in the Senate. So um, thank you for that. And this is, this is a, a serious public health issue that I'm hopeful we can address, if not in this reconciliation package down the road, for sure. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair. We'll now turn to um, Ms. Kathy Tenbrook, who joins us remotely. Um, I'm delighted to have Kathy join us as well. Kathy and I have had the opportunity to work together in a variety of environments over, over the years. So welcome, Kathy. Thank you very much. Cha Chairwoman Smith, Ranking Member Rounds, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Kathy Tenbrook, Assistant Commissioner and Executive Director of Minnesota's Interagency Council on Homelessness. And the council is a cabinet level body led by our Lieutenant Governor, Peggy Flanagan, comprised of the leaders of 13 state agencies. Minnesota has a strong history of bipartisan leadership on homelessness. I've worked on the issue for nearly 30 years in direct service and public policy roles. I have witnessed progress, missed opportunities, lessons learned and heartbreak we have in this moment a critical opportunity to shift how we respond to homelessness and to see it as the crisis and the public health emergency that it is. Today, I wanna to share with you what's working in Minnesota and where challenges remain. Minnesota is home to 87 counties and 11 tribal nations. Homelessness impacts every part of the state. Approximately 8,000 people are homeless on a given night, half are families with children, and 25% are people without shelters sleeping outside. Approximately 40% of all people identified as homeless are in rural parts of our state. One in four Minnesota households pays more than they can afford for housing, putting them at risk of homelessness. Over the last two decades, rents rose 21%, while incomes rose by just 3%. Homelessness shows the impacts of racism. In Minnesota, if you are Black, you are 15 times more likely to be homeless than a white Minnesotan. If you're Native American, you're 27 times more likely to be homeless. Our work on homelessness in Minnesota has shown uneven progress. Where we've had engagement and investment from all levels of government, we've had the greatest success. Our best proof that ending homelessness is possible is our collective work to end veteran homelessness. With dedicated resources guided by data and evidence, the outcomes have been stunning. We have effectively ended veteran homelessness in 85 of Minnesota's 87 counties. 
being a veteran in Minnesota is now a protective factor for homelessness. I look forward to the day when being a child is a protective factor, when having a serious health condition is a protective factor, and when your race does not increase your likelihood of becoming homeless. In Minnesota, we have increased resources for families with children, and that has driven a 32% decrease in family homelessness statewide in the decade starting in 2010. We credit these reductions to targeted prevention, coordination with employment services, and investment in families with the very highest barriers to accessing housing. We have learned over the years that all people are ready for housing. We need housing that is ready for them. The pandemic, while devastating and traumatic, was also a moment of great learning. Minnesota and federal resources helped us save lives during the pandemic. Statewide, we established 2,800 hotel rooms and other safe spaces to allow for physical distance, provide emergency staffing, food, supplies, isolation, and additional state housing support. The increased resources helped a struggling hospitality industry and expanded shelter services, created a hotel to home model, which connected people staying outside with permanent housing. In addition to the resources that helped protect people in shelters and outside, federal rental assistance during the pandemic was critical to stemming the tide of homelessness. Minnesota administered federal emergency rental assistance to every county in our state. Hennepin County reported that over 1,000 fewer children experienced homelessness in 2021 than they did two years earlier, and they credit that to the widespread availability of rental assistance. Sadly, those federal resources come to an end. We are starting to see a return to the 2019 rates of family homelessness. Federal investment during the pandemic has given Minnesota the opportunity to show what is possible. Federal partnership in tackling the challenges ahead will be critical to our success going forward. I have four high level recommendations to share with you and you'll find many more details in my submitted testimony as well. One, the homeless response workforce system is overwhelmed and underfunded. We need Congress to make more and sustained investments in housing and homelessness programs. During the pandemic, we witnessed the life-saving work of shelters and outreach workers. And we also know that while shelters do save lives, housing is what ends homelessness. Housing is out of reach for the lowest income Americans. We need Congress to increase the supply of housing as well as its affordability by making bold investments in rental assistance. Three, people with complex medical conditions, including substance use, mental illness, and other physical health issues are not well served in existing systems or interventions. We need increased investments and a stronger alignment of social services, healthcare, and housing. And finally, our system to prevent and end homelessness for veterans works. We need to sustain that commitment and we need to expand it to reach all populations. All of these solutions will require that we center the voices and experiences of people who have faced homelessness. They are the experts in what works. We know that housing is a social determinant of health, but it's also a social determinant of educational achievement, workforce growth, and neighborhood community and state and national well being. The resources that were invested to respond to the pandemic taught us what was possible, and it is my hope that we will continue to respond with that same level of urgency. I have never stopped believing that in Minnesota and in this country, we can achieve the vision that all people have a safe place to call home, that children and youth need not sleep in cars one night and go to school the next day, and that we can live in a state and a country without homelessness. This is a problem we know how to solve, and it is not a question of can we, but will we? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tenbrook. And I'm now happy to uh, welcome virtually to the committee, uh, Jamie Kirsch. Thank you so much to the committee uh, for inviting me to be here today. Uh, I am a current and active board member for Journey On, and I'm also a non-law enforcement employee of the Rapid City Police Department. Journey On was incorporated as a nonprofit in 2018 by founder Tracy Sigdestad, who is a member of the Mohawk tribe. In early 2020, Journey On was focused on Native youth mentorship and substance abuse recovery. It was also in early 2020 when Rapid City, the Rapid City Police Department was awarded a community-based crime reduction grant through BJA. When determining what to focus the grant on, it seemed essential to address houselessness given that it was roughly generating 65% of calls. Additionally, it was clear that Native Americans suffered from houselessness disproportionately, making up over 80% of those who were considered literally houseless. 
The high call volume resulted in low morale among officers as they were not equipped with the tools to address the causes of houselessness nor the resources to provide sustainable solutions. Realizing the need for greater collaboration and coordination with Native-led social service organizations, the Rapid City Police Department approached Journey On to see if they would consider building capacity for a community-initiated response to Rapid City's growing houseless community. Soon thereafter, a core group of partners from Journey On, the Police Department, and the University of South Dakota applied for a HUD ESG CARES Act funding grant. Since, this grant has funded 75% of Journey On street outreach efforts. In January of 2021, the city approved a contract with Journey On funding three full-time positions and providing two city vans to conduct outreach in. Since early December of 2021, Journey On has responded to nearly 5,000 calls through 911 dispatch. Journey On operates as part of a larger co-response team that includes uh, the Police Department's Quality of Life Unit, the Fire Department's Mobile Medic Team, Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board, Pennington County Health and Human Services, and Volunteers of America. And since early December, we estimate that Journey On has saved the city of Rapid City nearly $873,000. Journey On has 13 employees and all but one is Native American. All have lived experience with houselessness, the criminal justice system, and or addiction. Each of Journey On's team members are credible messengers and use a culture forward approach to service. Most of Journey On's board members are Native American as well. Our Native American community members don't believe in the stigmas that come with the concept of homelessness and prefer the term houselessness or houseless relatives. In March of 2022, a collection of partners, including Volunteers of America, Journey On, RCPD, and the City of Rapid City developed the We Connect Business Toolkit. The 29-page booklet focuses on educating businesses about the houseless population, Native American culture, mental health challenges, appropriate responses to our houseless community, and many other topics. This was a critical piece of connecting Journey On to the broader community and solidifying their role as a first responder to our houseless community members. Now for the challenges, some of our key organizational challenges are come with federal funding. Federal funding does not allow for staff to receive paid time off and provides no avenue for healthcare or retirement benefits. The 10% de minimis rate is too low to accommodate the needed staffing to run a team effectively or to meet the administrative burden created by data tracking requirements. The reimbursement based nature of federal grants makes it difficult for organizations that are small minority led and exist in rural or smaller urban settings to secure federal grants and maintain them. Developing capacity for community based organizations like Journey On is difficult. When Journey On agreed to develop a street outreach program for Rapid City, they had one employee, no functioning board members and no sustainable revenue streams. Over the past two years, a collective group of board members invested an incredible amount of time to develop capacity for Journey On. Journey On is one of three local Native-led organizations now working with the White House on the Community Violence Intervention Collaborative, or CIVIC. Through CIVIC, Journey On is receiving technical assistance and many grant support to grow their capacity. The White House CIVIC initiative needs much more funding over a longer period of time to support the types of local innovations it is set out to create and support. Housing challenges. First, in Rapid City, we have very few options for emergency shelter. According to the 2022 point in time count, Rapid City reported 35% of the overall total of unsheltered houseless individuals and families in the state, which is more by 15% than what the largest city in South Dakota reports with nearly two and a half times the population. Second, while we understand the housing first model, some folks are not ready to go straight into permanent housing and require traditional housing options. Folks who are not used to living in a home on their own need to relearn really how to care for their home. They need to create new social networks and they need to learn new routines and methods to comply with rules in the space to, to do that. Third, Rapid City is 3,000 affordable housing units short of what it needs. The wait list for South Dakota Housing and Development Authority rehousing programs is 180 people long and Pennington County Housing has maintained a wait list of 3,200 people for years. In Rapid City, it is nearly impossible to incentivize developers to get involved in affordable housing projects. Market rate apartments are going at a premium and developing in the Black Hills is costly. There are very few federal incentives that developers can take advantage of to develop enough inventory to address the need. And lastly, the pit count does not allow communities to truly capture those who are housing insecure, and it certainly does not allow us to capture houselessness in the way that our Native American community members experience it. Many of those living in our tribal areas don't have access to any form of, of emergency shelter, and they're living sometimes 20 people to a one-bedroom home because they have to. Some of these homes are not fit for human habitation, having no roof or siding to keep it safe from the elements, and no running water, electricity, or trash collection. 
And with that, I would like to thank the committee and the members of the Senate who invited Journey on here to speak today and for taking time to learn about how our innovative model works here in Rapid City and the challenges we face in still making it sustainable. Thank you so much uh, to all of you. We will now begin our uh, round of questions from senators. Each senator will have um, approximately five minutes, and I um, would like to have Senator Reid go first. Well, I thank the chairwoman for her graciousness, and thank you all for your excellent testimony. And I can tell you the same story you, you just told us. In Providence, Rhode Island, the uh, average rents have jumped 23.8% uh, in the previous year. That's extraordinary. Uh, we're running out of our emergency rental assistance funds. Uh, the emergency shelters are closing down. Our frontline staff, as you well know, is really burning out after the pandemic. Uh, and that's why it's essential, I think, that we increase funding for the homelessness assistance grants. And uh, that would include the Continuum of Care Program, which serves over 750,000 people, and also the emergency solutions grants, uh, serving another approximately 350,000. Uh, so, Ms. Oliva, are, are there, uh, why are federal resources like homelessness assistance grants essential to combating homelessness, particularly as the pandemic-specific programs begin to wind down? Thank you so much, Senator Reid, for that question. As you might remember, I actually ran those programs at HUD for, for about 10 years, so they're, mm -hmm. they're near and dear to my, to my heart. Uh, you know, those programs uh, through, that are funded through the Homeless Assistance Grants count, and uh, I would also count HUD-VASH in that sort of general group of homelessness-specific programs, really form the backbone of our homelessness response in this country. And uh, in a lot of communities, not all communities, but in a lot of communities, they are most of the funding that is uh, available for homeless assistance programs. So increasing resources in the Continuum of Care program and through the ESG program and HUD-BASH are sort of the, the, the backbone and the lifeline for many communities and their response to homelessness. It also creates um, a way for HUD to be able to um, put forth promising practice practices and evidence-based approaches and prioritize funding for those types of resources. Uh, since we're talking about the Continuum of Care program, I would note three things. Uh, first is, thank you so much for uh, the legislation that allows tribes to receive and uh, be eligible for uh, the Continuum of Care program. It's incredibly important. There are some issues related to implementation that we're all working out right now, but it was incredibly important. Two, uh, in HUD's uh, last budget request, they asked for, for two tools that I think are gonna be really important in addition to uh, an increase in, in the funding for those programs. One is increasing the cap on planning for continuums of care. That's really important because uh, continuums of care are really the subject matter experts. And as funding is coming into communities that, that goes through other types of um, uh, sort of mechanisms, it's important for COCs to have planning dollars to work with them. Uh, they also mentioned wanting a two-year NOFA cycle, and we would support that. The National Alliance supports that, um, in part for some of the reasons that Ranking Member Rounds mentioned. Uh, local COCs need some time to be able to do implementation, and having a two-year funding cycle would be really helpful there. The last thing that I would note that was raised by, by um, one of my colleagues up here on the panel is around staffing and increasing. Uh, the COC program requires increases in fair market rents and uh, leasing amounts that, that are commensurate with what's happening in the community. Uh, I would say we need to do the same for staffing so that uh, providers are properly resourced and can provide their staff with cost of living increases when when they need to. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me just shift quickly, because you mentioned Hud Vash, uh, to uh, your colleague, Ms. Manet, I think. Uh, one of the things I've observed, is, first of all, Hud Vash program is extremely useful. Uh, but there are many areas where the vouchers are going underutilized. Is that an issue you've identified? And can you give us some insights why they're being underutilized? Absolutely. I think that there are a number of issues to unpack there from a lack of staffing at VA for case managers to a rental market that may not be as willing to accept vouchers. I think we hear from communities across the country that it is just getting 
harder and harder to move veterans with vouchers into permanent housing. And I think even for some of the veterans that already have vouchers to retain the housing they have because the housing market is just so hot and landlords can move on to other higher paying clientele. And so I do think that we need to get creative around how we can incentivize landlords and PHAs to get vouchers out the door, but also how we support VA to better case manage folks who are utilizing vouchers and how we can give them some flexibility there. Thank you very much, Ms. McGinnery. Thank you for your efforts. My time has expired, but I want to thank all the panelists for your not only thoughtful uh, testimony today, but for your incredible efforts. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Reid. Um, I want to start with, um, I want to start here. I think each of you in one way or another talked about the, uh, the great benefit of the, um, during, this, during the course of the pandemic, um, the, um, the impact of the um, uh, resources that we were able to provide for rental assistance and the child tax credit and other strategies to help lift people's income and also help make housing more affordable. And several of you also talked about um, how this was an opportunity for some, um, some time around innovation and really trying some new things and finding some examples of, of really uh, real success on the ground. Um, you know, um, and Ms. Tembrook, I'm going to turn to you first. I've been really heartened to see some real successes in Minnesota, where in Hennepin County, we've seen the lowest number of people experiencing homelessness, I think, um, in the last 17 years. So could you just share with us uh, briefly what we've seen in Minnesota about um, the impact on the ground of COVID relief funding streams and what, um, what lessons, what, what are the key lessons or takeaways in terms of what we've learned to do, good lessons that we've learned during the course of this um, terrible time? Thank you very much, Senator Smith. I'm happy to respond to that. You know, we were able with the COVID federal resources just to be so much more flexible and to get those dollars out to community quickly to respond to the crisis at hand. And because of that, and because we were we were turning to communities and saying, what is going to work? And what do you need to make this work? They were coming up with innovations that we have not seen before. You know, when we when the pandemic hit, and as, as many of you know, many, many people sought refuge in encampments. At one point in Minneapolis, we had an encampment uh, in South Minneapolis with over 200 tents, um, people really uh, struggling. And we were able to use federal resources quickly to stand up some new programming, one being a culturally specific shelter that could able that could bring people inside that, but for that kind of a shelter that could meet their needs, they may have remained outside and unsafe. Uh, one of our housing providers who was helping us stand up uh, hotel to home models, which was another very, very innovative project, of course, that we had never done before, helping the hospitality industry, but also standing up um, models that would work with people, bring them into hotels to protect them from the pandemic, but then very, very intensely work, work with them to get them out of those hotels into permanent housing so they didn't return to the streets. Uh, during that uh, big, large encampment, that same provider went into the encampment. They literally talked with almost every single person staying in the encampment to find out from them what would work to bring them in and make them feel safe. And they developed a, a program called Avivo Village. It is literally an indoor village of structures where people had their own privacy, their own space. They could come in, they could be safe. And once again, like the hotel program, they could work individually to help try to get people out and into permanent stable housing, which is the goal of, of all of the programs that we are, we're working on. So um, I can't say enough about how uh, important the flexibility and the way they were delivered with urgency uh, made such a difference. And it wasn't just in the metro area, even though that's where maybe things were most visible in terms of the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, in Rochester, multiple organizations, uh, including the city library system, partnered to operate warming space and overnight shelter. Um, and, you know, moving people uh, in Ramsey County out of hotels and into um, supportive programs. The American Indian Community Development Corporation was just an amazing partner the whole time with trying to increase the amount of really specific native focused work, which is who was really most dramatically impacted um, by unsheltered homelessness during the pandemic. So uh, very grateful in Minnesota for the resources we were able to use along with rental assistance that kept um, 
that kept people in their housing. Hennepin County really truly did see fewer people experiencing homelessness during the pandemic than before because of rental assistance. And I think that proves to us that that is the kind of intervention, sometimes for very small amounts of resource, we can keep people in housing and prevent long-term costs and obviously the trauma of homelessness on children. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to um, return to the other members of the panel to ask a kind of a follow-up to that question. But um, I know that Senator, I believe that Senator Tester from Montana is online, and I would I like am. to give Senator Tester a chance to ask questions. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and it's good to be here. And uh, unfortunately, this is an issue that uh, is, is fundamental to communities and life and families and all that stuff. Uh, uh, Ms. Monet, it's good to see you again. Um, uh, as you know, one of the most successful initiatives uh, in the effort to end veterans homelessness is the HUD-VASH program. This program continues to suffer from uh, VA's ability to hire case managers. So I would love to know what your thoughts are on VA's current effort to resolve this issue, both internally and through contracting. So I think I'll, I'm sorry. I think I'll start by saying that contracting is a really great opportunity to address some of the shortages, but I do think that there is a lot more that VA can do. What we saw during the pandemic was that VA was getting creative about using some of the rescue plan and CARES funding to actually pay for hiring incentives and moving costs to recruit HUD-VASH case managers to communities where they might have otherwise had a hard time doing that. Now, they're not able to do that once the current... Um, emergency health designation ends. So I think that that's one thing. Um, I do think we've also seen communities where VA has gotten really creative around what constitutes HUD-VASH case management, meaning that they're taking a more multi multidisciplinary approach and utilizing the support of peers to kind of help stretch the ability of a licensed clinical social worker, for example, to be able to successfully case manage the veterans on their caseload. So I think that there's a lot more that we can dive into if Congress is willing to support them in doing that. Okay. Um, so th this this goes to you, uh, uh, Ms. Money, again. I, I think I'll also see if Kathy Tenbrook would like to, to, to visit about this. And I, I heard your opening statements. But housing is not only uh, not available for low-income folks, it's not available for workforce folks. Um, and I would say Montana, it's not available in Montana, but but I would bet you Chairwoman Smith could say it's not available in Minnesota. And I would bet you uh, Senator Cortez Masto would say it's not available in Nevada. It's not available anywhere. Workforce housing, it is an incredible uh, boat anchor. It's one of the reasons I wish we would have done something this Congress, but we're doing nothing. And in my opinion, it's a problem that will solve itself, but it'll probably take 30 or 40 years to do it. What do you two uh, think we could do to help speed up availability, and I'll leave low income out of it, just affordable housing for folks uh, to be able to fill jobs and, and, and important jobs too, whether it's a teacher or an auto mechanic or, or a, a bricklayer or whatever it might be. Is there anything the federal government can do or is this just uh, live with it and uh, communities continue to struggle to find places for for entrepreneurs and for, for folks in, in, in the working class to live. Go ahead, you can go first, Ms. Monet. Well, I think what we've seen during the pandemic is that some communities have gotten really creative around taking existing space and converting it into housing. And I think we've seen this predominantly for affordable housing, but I think it is a model that could work for workforce housing as well and potentially might be easier to execute because you wouldn't be worrying about rental subsidies and such. So what did they, what did they use what did they use to mon for money to to do this uh, rehab? I I want to pitch this to Anne Oliva on the panel who might be better equipped to ask or answer. Go ahead, pitch, it, pitch it to her. I I just want answers. I don't care who answers them. Oh. Well, I I I was pointing to me. So, so the work works model is all about work and all about getting people back to work, but also creating opportunities for people who have jobs so, to be able to sustain here, housing. Here, here's the so, problem. No, stop, just stop. Here's the problem. We got people. We got. We don't have any people. Well, we got jobs up the gazoo. I mean, jobs up the gazoo. Yeah. You can walk in, have no college experience, and you can get a good paying job. 
but they can't be hired because there's no place to live. How do we fix that problem? So what I was going to say is that the part of the model where we can create cost-effective affordable housing is through converting commercial spaces. The problem is, is there is no funding to do that from the federal level because it's not traditional units, you know, and all the regulations. But you can have very high quality residences like, you know, the former SROs reimagined um, that can accommodate workforce populations that we know we need to invest in higher wages and training so that people can move up the career ladder. But for that first rung workforce, it is practical and cost effective to convert commercial spaces, hotels, and other types of housing stock because it gets quicker and faster. The problem is the funding stream. So as we talk about innovative solutions, not, we should not only expand on the existing funding streams, but we need to think more about other models that can be funded so that it is possible for developers on the ground to quickly act and create housing. Okay. Since you're from Minnesota, Kathy, maybe the chairwoman would let you respond to that real quickly because I'm out of time. Happy Thank you for the opportunity, yeah. Senator. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairwoman Smith. Um, I, I think it's an all-in strategy, Senator. I mean, there is frankly no wrong affordable housing uh, investment. You know, I think in Minnesota, as it probably is true everywhere, our largest source of housing um, resource to create housing is the federal um, low-income tax credit. And I think increasing the opportunities to invest in that is hugely important. But many, many of the various ways that we create housing are all needed. And to your point, Senator, I, I couldn't agree more. We need housing supply at all price points. So that's not just low income. And it's also true that we need to make sure that our tools in our toolbox will work to create lower income housing as well. We are 100,000 units short of housing that people at the very lowest incomes in Minnesota can afford. And that's more dramatic than the rest of the, of the population. But I, I agree with you, we need it at all levels. Thank you very much. Appreciate the hospitality, Ms. Madam Chairwoman. We'll talk to you guys, thank you. Thank you, Senator Chester. Um, I believe that we have uh, Senator Cortez Masto who's ready on, uh, on, uh, from her office. I am, Madam Chair, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. So thank you to all the panelists, because I am going to follow up on what my colleague from Montana got absolutely right. And you all know this is um, to address the affordable housing needs in our communities uh, to make sure that those that are homeless, those that are workforce, um, uh, we are providing uh, a roof over their head. There is a role for Congress to play. And you guys have touched on it. And I have been uh, talking to the housing coalitions in my state about this is at the end of the day, we have to make a pencil out for the builders. We have to cobble together financing uh, to figure out how we build more of a supply so that we can make it affordable housing. One of the things, and, and, and for the panelists, if anybody disagrees with this, please let me know. But I, I think one of the things we can focus on to do that here in, in Congress is just to, uh, and this is, I believe, um, Senator Cantwell's bill, and I think there's bipartisan support for it, is expand low-income housing tax credit. It's the number one thing I hear from my builders, from people in my community. Um, there's some positive provisions in there that will enable us to pencil out um, for those builders um, the opportunity to add additional units. Does anybody disagree with that? No, definitely not. Um, but I would add the HOME program and the National Housing Trust Fund to the list of, um, of programs that could be expanded to increase affordable housing supply. Absolutely, and that's, that's on my list as well. And that, that actually is something that uh, we could work through appropriations to, to get done. Um, and uh, so thank you. I, if there's anything else on your list, please let me know. But I, I think it is important for us to, to hear that here in Washington, in Congress, that there's some very simple things for us to do that if we just focus on, we can address this issue. I, in my state, I will tell you, um, my concern and the number one calls I'm getting about uh, housing is not just workforce housing, but I am hearing uh, from veterans and seniors in my state who, who are facing sharp increases in their monthly rent and who are worried that they will be out on the streets um, because they are uh, there's not enough affordable housing options. So can I... I let me ask um, uh, Ms. Uh, Monet, um, with respect to uh, veterans, is there, 
can you talk a little bit about this? Is, are, is there a certain type of housing that's needed? Is there, um, a, do, what should we be looking at, particularly when we're looking for, uh, to address the homelessness of veterans, which has increased in my state, unfortunately, and we have to be focused on it? So I think an all-in approach is what's needed. We hear so much from veterans that certain approaches like permanent supportive housing are great, and for other groups, they're not, right? Some folks want to be in project-based sites, others don't. But I think when you're thinking about the at-risk population, so folks who are you know, living somewhere and the rent is increasing dramatically, really what's going to help is not necessarily new housing, but direct cash sure. transfers, right? So when you think about VA shallow subsidy program via the SSVF program, that's a really great approach to help folks who are kind of on the brink retain their housing and stay housed. So I think more of that and potentially maybe even the ability for HUD to do something similar would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let me touch on something else, which is interesting. I'm looking at the statistics from HUD. Um, uh, what is interesting to me is in the past few years, um, Nevada and some other states have seen a decrease in the percentage of youth experiencing homelessness. Um, federal continuum of care grants support critical services, including homelessness uh, prevention and wraparound services. Uh, is there a lesson to be learned there? What what there's a decrease in youth homelessness, but now we're seeing it in other areas. And I guess my question uh, for the panel, maybe uh, I'll start with uh, Miss uh, uh, Oliva, um, is what, what are we learning from there? Uh, have we done something uh, that really opens the door for more services, more opportunities uh, for to work with our youth? Or I'm just kind of curious if you have any ideas about what's happening there. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, the first thing I want to do is go back to make one point uh, from your earlier question. There are three things that we need to do on affordable housing. We need to preserve the affordable housing that we have. We need to increase supply through the programs that we talked about. And we need to increase affordability to pencil those projects out, as you mentioned, by expanding the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Those three things together will make a huge difference. On the question about youth, yeah, um, you know, Congress appropriated funds for the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program. That program has provided a lot of funding, flexible, pretty flexible funding, and um, system level funding to help communities build resources that really meet the needs of young people who are experiencing homelessness, um, especially young people of color and LGBTQ young people. Um, the, the difference about that program, and actually changed the way that I think about my work, is that young people are involved um, in every aspect of that program. They're involved in the design, they're involved locally with decision making, um, they actually have helped score applications at the national level, and that really points to what we can do more broadly, which is make sure that we are partnering with people who have lived experience of homelessness and these systems that we're trying to change so that we are leaning on their expertise and, and learning from them and partnering with them. So I think there's a number of things to learn from the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program that can be applied across the board. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Cortez Masto. We are now joined by Senator Van Hollen um, from his office. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for holding this hearing and for the focus you've had on these really important issues of affordable housing, which uh, become more urgent and severe uh, with every passing day. Uh, and I think we all recognize there are two big pieces to this equation. One, of course, is uh, supply, uh, but the other is making sure that we continue to make available, uh, as was just indicated um, in the testimony, uh, housing choice uh, vouchers. And um, thank you, Madam Chair, for also mentioning the legislation that Senator Young and I uh, have proposed, bipartisan legislation that would allow more families uh, to move to areas of opportunity with more flexible wraparound services. Uh, and I think we all saw that during the pandemic, uh, the Congress, uh, together with President Biden, provided important emergency services and uh, things, in my view, would have been a lot worse, uh, but for those uh, important emergency supports. But now we've, of course, got uh, the long-term challenges uh, that we continue uh, to face. Um, Ms. Oliva, if you could talk about the challenge we're facing right now with respect to uh, the purchasing power of the Housing Choice Voucher Program. As you see, 
uh, rising uh, rental rates and you see uh, you know, a, a demand for rental housing uh, that's increasing, um, more and more you know, landlords uh, want to lease to the person who can quickly make a security deposit or somebody who can uh, defray other costs that are not currently covered uh, by the housing choice voucher. So should we be asking HUD to use some of its existing authorities uh, to make the use of those vouchers more flexible? Because in Maryland, for example, um, we're seeing about 80% uh, of the vouchers uh, for uh, 2022 um, are, are, are not able to be used. People are not able to match those vouchers up um, with landlords because of the intense competition and the fact they can't use uh, the, the voucher purchasing power for some of those expenses. Could you speak briefly to that? Sure. I, I think that there's actually quite a bit to learn from the emergency housing voucher program implementation. As I mentioned in my testimony, we're up to about 90% either leased up or issued to uh, families and individuals who are experiencing homelessness. And in some communities like King County um, in Washington state, the, the utilization rate is quite high, even in really tight markets. And the reason that we're seeing that is um, because of the flexibilities that Congress provided to HUD for the implementation of that program, including alternative requirements and waivers that make it easier to get people into the program, but most importantly, um, uh, providing funding to allow for landlord incentives, housing navigation, um, the kinds of things that, that programs can use, that PHAs can use to partner with landlords and, and create ways and be flexible and be creative um, in, in how they partner at the local level. So I think, um, and I, I, I think that Catherine would agree that we should implement those kinds of flexibilities and those kinds of um, flexible funding for programs like hud -Vash and other parts of the Housing Choice Voucher Program generally so that other, you know, uh, other programs that are not the EHV program can use them and, and hopefully bring up utilization. Uh, Ms. Tenbrook, would you agree with that uh, assessment with respect to uh, using the authorities to be flexible? Yes, I do actually agree with what Ann just shared. Thank you. Thank you. So let me uh, ask a question, then, Ms. Oliva, uh, uh, about the housing first approach, because I think there's sometimes confusion um, where some people suggest that housing first excludes a number of the wraparound services when in fact, at least to my understanding, that's an important part of the model, but we want to make sure that uh, people do have a safe place to live and call home as they uh, access uh, those wraparound services. So can you, can you talk a little bit about the benefits of the housing first approach? Yes, of course. And thank you for that question. I agree with you that there is a lot of misinformation out there, and I'm happy to try and dispel some of that misinformation uh, as part of this hearing today. So Housing First is really an approach rather than a program. It's an approach that is grounded in treating people with dignity and providing choice uh, to people who are in vulnerable uh, situations and experiencing homelessness. It means that Ac um, to accessing permanent housing is prioritized so that people who are experiencing homelessness have a safe and stable foundation to support achieving other goals. I recently heard somebody describe it something like this. You don't give a drowning person a swimming lesson. You bring them to safety on shore and then decide whether they actually need a swimming lesson or whether something else was happening. And let me be really clear on this point. Housing first is never housing only when it is implemented according to the model. Services are offered um, even before a person moves into their permanent housing and they are tailored to the needs of the person or family. The evidence base is incredibly strong. We have high retention rates. Um, and then the last thing I'll also say is that data also shows cost savings for a housing first approach in a lot of cases, because as people have more consistent support, 
um, and they don't have to access emergency services, the cost to the community goes down. So there's a lot of evidence behind Housing First. It is really rooted in dignity and choice, and it is not housing only. Well, thank you, and thank you for dispelling some of the, the myths that I think uh, we've, we've heard. Uh, a lot more questions, but I see that time is up. So, Madam Chair, thank you very much uh, for bringing us together around this important subject. Thank you very much, Senator Van Hollen. Um, I am going to ask a few more questions while I have the opportunity of, with all of you. And I want to actually go back to, um, um, I'd like to go to Ms. Kirsch, who is uh, with us remotely. I really appreciated very much the comments that you um, made around uh, the unique challenges in um, Native communities and on tribal land. And so, Ms. Kirsch, this question is for you. Um, um, can you um, can you describe for us what you have seen um, in your work around good approaches to addressing the challenges and overcrowding in Native and tribal communities? And how can we best be sensitive to this issue from a policymaking perspective as we um, look at the programs and policies that we want to advance? Sure, thank you so much for the question, Senator. Um, so I guess I would say first and foremost, uh, what we see here in Rapid City is having what, what's having the greatest impact is, is doing the outreach, putting culture first and allowing folks to access resources and individuals who are Native American and who can provide Native American uh, resources to them, um, helping them access support there from there um, that is either housing or addiction recovery or mental health support or medical services, being able to connect folks to those spaces that are offering, um, you know, sage burning or, or smudging, um, offering folks connection to anipis. These can all be healing factors and make uh, a person far more successful in their housing search and their securing of services throughout the spectrum. Um, it's challenging, right, because in, in Rapid City, we are flanked by some of the most impoverished uh, counties in our nation, and there is a vast, uh, I think, issue with underdevelopment and underinvestment in our tribal areas. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of cases, uh, it's hard to do affordable housing development because there is no infrastructure. There's no um, water infrastructure, electrical infrastructure, and so there is a lot more costs associated and affiliated with with trying to uh, do affordable housing development in those areas. In Rapid City, because we are such an urban center um, and because folks come from you know, hundreds of miles to seek support here in Rapid City, um, I think the, the key is really creating um, models through which folks can get supported in the way they want to be supported and feel comfortable in those spaces, um, whether it is, you know, I, I totally support the housing first model, um, but because we have absolutely no uh, permanent housing available or affordable housing available for individuals, folks are feeling most comfortable in congregate shelters, right, mm -hmm. that put culture first and they are more successful uh, with their goals once they're able to access that culture and that community. So I, I hope I answered your question. No, that's and, very and helpful. Think, it's very helpful. Great. And as I listen to your response, I am struck by what we know, which is that um, um, one of the, you know, the, the, the connection, that the, the challenge that people feel around just deep isolation as they are experiencing housing insecurity or houselessness. And, and to me, that makes it particularly clear that taking a um, a kind of a culture first approach or housing first culture first approach putting culture at the center of the work um, makes the most difference because that is a way of overcoming that sense of isolation that people feel is that would you agree with that oh a hundred percent I would agree with that yes um, I want to touch also um, on the question of the connection between housing and health and Ms. Oliva, I think I will direct this question to you. Can you just discuss this connection between housing and health and specifically how per, you know, permanent support of housing or the, you know, what we can do to sort of understand that we cannot really address people's health issues if we're not finding, a, if they don't have a safe place to live? Well, I, I think you actually just summarized it perfectly and it's the, the biggest lesson or one of the biggest lessons we've learned during the pandemic is that you can't, you, you can't shelter in place if you don't have a home. Um, and housing is absolutely core to being able to be healthy um, 
from a behavioral health standpoint and from a physical health standpoint. So I, I think the biggest lesson, as I mentioned, is during from the pandemic is really about this connection mm -hmm. between the ability to be healthy and, and having a safe and stable place to live. Safe and stable places to live also sort of um, help advance the positive impacts of other types of investments that the government is making in healthcare, in education, in employment. All of those things uh, are better when somebody, as we have seen from the Housing First model and permanent supportive housing, um, really housing provides the foundation by which all of those other aspects of life um, can be improved and people can thrive in their communities. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about healthcare, it's actually about all of those other pieces and what housing brings to the table um, to improve them. I, um, I really appreciate that. I, um, I think I'm, I'm proud that Minnesota has been an innovator in this area, um, uh, really c understanding the social determinants um, of health. And um, the Minnesota Medicaid program covers housing support services to help Minnesotans find and maintain affordable housing and making that connection directly. This is honestly a weakness of lots of federal strategies, right? Because we're very siloed and we don't connect the dots as best we could. And then that means that providers like, um, you know, the, the people that are out there trying to make things work are struggling all the time because those dots don't connect as well as they should. And I think that that is, I think I'm, that's one example of what we're doing in Minnesota with the Medicaid program that I think helps with that. Would anybody else like to comment on that um, connection? Yes, please, Ms. McDevitt. Yes, thank you so much. And and I would just you know uh, build upon what what Ann was saying as far as um, you know access to um, employment and income you know is another metric around stability and and health. And I think one thing that gets um, sort of lost in some of these conversations is you, there is a, there's a group of people using the metaphor of drowning that don't even have access to a life ring. And so we need to create more life rings, mm -hmm. how, whatever, whatever metaphor you want to use. And I think that this is about expanding our, our ability to use a housing first approach beyond just the tools that we have to promote health, stability, and access to economic opportunity, I would argue, is a, you know part of the social determinants of health, um, especially for those people who not only need the income because they're not going to qualify for other benefits, but also are parents and taking care of their families and returning from incarceration and need access to jobs that, while they might be available, they're not prepared for or stable enough for. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about housing first, I would argue that we should also look at it, as Anne said, as, as a, you know, a category, um, a philosophy, but we need to look at it beyond just you know, units themselves and really start talking about how do we help people stabilize off the streets, out of institutions, um, with the support services they need to be, live the best lives that they can. And there is a group of people, as I mentioned, that's about 40% of folks that are coming into our shelters every day that are not self-resolving and need, you know, do not have those access, even if we had enough units, even if we had enough vouchers, they are not qualifying. And so that is why I think when we talk about models that can bring in the public and have also other, other benefits to the community, the reason that something like WorkWorks can really add value to a community is it brings in the business community. It creates better conditions uh, for quality of life for the whole community, which gets more people involved in wanting to solve this issue. And I think that that is an important point that we have to remember, um, as we need a community-wide approach, not just um, you know, one that is focused just on government um, or service providers. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm gonna wrap up in just a moment, but I wanna see if Ms. Monet or Ms. Tenbrook would like to add anything more to this question about the connection between housing and health and um, what we need to do to uh, break down the barriers around those two issues. Ms. Monet. Yeah, I think I'm happy to add on because you know VA is the nation's <laughs> largest healthcare system that's also providing a really great deal of housing resources to veterans. And I think what we see is that Access to housing helps people manage chronic conditions when you think about the fact that certain medications need to be refrigerated and you can't really do that when you're unsheltered. When you think about the fact that you're able to access healthier food and store healthier food in a home to help you manage your chronic conditions through diet and other things. But 
I do think that there are also, you know, psychological benefits to being housed and not being subject to, mm-hmm. you know, all of the violence that we see unsheltered people face on the streets on a daily basis. And, you know, the fact that you have somewhere that you can call your own is a really big deal, I think, especially as we look to the ways that many cities and communities across the country are starting to criminalize homelessness and, you know, rely on encampment sweeps. That's really traumatic when you think about the fact that everything you own, what little you've been able to retain, mm-hmm. can be gone in an instant. And Repeatedly, right? I mean, that's a really hard thing for people to deal with, I think. So, you know, housing is a really critical resource. And I think that's why we all have um, tended to look at the fact that we need to pe- put people in housing and then wrap them with the services that, you know, they want and need. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Tembrook, Ms. Kirsch, would you have anything final to add before we wrap up? Thank you, Chair Smith. I think you, you summed this up so well. And I think the experience during COVID puts such a spotlight on your on your question and the importance of the question. I mean, one thing we knew that when the pandemic hit, people who were experiencing homelessness were at greatest risk of really um, devastating results because of the pandemic, not only because of the settings where people were living where they couldn't be um, distanced, but obviously many people also have co-occurring very serious health conditions. And I think the data that we have from the pandemic, for example, if if people were sleeping outside and they contracted COVID, they were 11 times more likely to end up in the hospital than other Minnesotans that had COVID and eight times more likely to end up in the ICU. So both the conditions and the settings are so important and we need to start to connect the dots between our housing systems, our social service systems, our health systems uh, to be successful in serving people better. Thank you very much. And I'll just offer quickly that in terms of public health, uh, I think trauma and the impact of a traumatic experience of houselessness, especially in our youth, can have a lifelong effect on on our young people. And we see it time and time, you know, again, here in, in Rapid City, where we see youth who are affected by uh, houselessness or um, coming in contact with law enforcement and really coming up with creative ways to respond to our houseless community members to minimize that trauma and to truly support innovative practices and sustainable solutions, creating opportunities with individuals to identify the resources they truly need to become housing successful. Um, And that includes everything from culture, which I've talked a lot about, but all the way through uh, to helping folks stay housed once they are housed, Uh, housing prevention, um, uh, or preventing houselessness is, is is incredibly important, and I would say as important, right, as addressing the actual uh, houselessness occurring on our streets. If we can help uh, minimize the amount of trauma youth are experiencing as a result of evictions, and instead coming up with innovative innovative ways to help families stay homed, mm-hmm. I think we're far more successful in the end with our efforts than we are just responding at the crisis. And thanks again for allowing me to be here today to testify. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today and providing um, such great testimony. Um, I am struck as I listen to the questions and also your answers and testimony that the there is, there is broad agreement about what needs to be done. As I said at the outset, I think we know what to do. We understand the centrality of housing to work, um, to health, um, to, um, uh, to, you know, physical and emotional health. And um, the, 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 We've also been able to see the innovation and the success that we've seen because of the um, because of the um, resources that we put into the COVID, um, you know, the, the deep COVID challenge. Uh, those those challenges are still there, and in fact, I think we are seeing the great impact of some of those resources going away right now. Um, so I think the uh, this. This hearing has given, I think, all of us lots of good thoughts for where we can go from here and the work that we have to do together. Um, Before we adjourn, I would like to enter into the record a letter from Catholic Charities of St. Paul and Minneapolis without objection, and I see none. Um, For senators who wish to submit questions for the record, those questions will be due one week from today, which will be Tuesday, July 26th. For our witnesses, you will have 45 days to respond to any questions for the record. Um, Thank you again so much, and this hearing is adjourned.